Hello, everybody. Uh, today we're talking about Chapter 6, uh, Advanced Bonding Topics. This is a direct follow-up to Chapter 5 and kind of an extension of it with some new um, AP-specific topics that have to do with um, bonding and especially drawing Lewis structures. So today we'll be drawing a bunch of Lewis structures, and um, last time we learned how to tell its polarity, but today we're going to learn a whole bunch of other things that we can tell about a compound. That we can write formal charges for that compound, determine if resonance is available, um, look at the bond order, do the Vesper theory to figure out its 3D shape, and figure out the bond hybridization. This is kind of a grab bag of a bunch of different things that have to do with bonding. I don't think any of them individually are very difficult, but there's a lot. So there's probably like six or seven different mini topics we're going to have that um, have to do with bonding, which is why I broke this up from the last chapter so it wasn't too overwhelming. So this is kind of a follow-up of chapter five, all the new sort of things that we're going to learn to go with Lewis structures. All right, so to get started, we have Lewis structures. Sometimes it's possible to draw a few different variations of a Lewis structure. To determine which Lewis structure is the lowest in energy, we can assign formal charges to each atom in a compound. A formal charge is kind of like an individual check for each atom to see how stable it feels. Our goal in a compound um, is for every single thing in that compound, every single atom it's made of, to be relatively stable. Otherwise, the compound will fall apart. So let's look at an example of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a good example here because it could be drawn a couple of different ways. And equally, they are both valid. Okay? But we can actually figure out which one is better, which one is more stable. They're both going to work, but one of them is going to be preferred. And we'll have to talk about why. So let's start with this example here of carbon dioxide, CO2. So uh, if I want to draw this Lewis structure, carbon has four valence electrons, oxygen has six times two, so it's 12 plus four. I have 16 electrons in my drawing, okay? Okay, so carbon will go in the middle. My oxygens will go on either side, and then normally you would add lone pairs until everything is fully satisfied, meaning everything has a total of eight electrons, like we know how to do. Unfortunately, when I do it like this, that's 20, which means I have to make some double or triple bonds. So I'm gonna erase a uh, lone pair here, and I'm gonna choose the right side, but it doesn't matter, I could pick the left side and we have kind of the same thing. But I have a carbon, double bonded to an O now. That saved me two electrons, brought me down to 18, and I'm gonna do it again. And this is where the interesting thing happens because you have a choice. You can make a double bond here and make it symmetric. And we've talked about that being how we should do it in class. We say, if you don't know, err on the side of symmetry, okay? But you also could equally make a triple bond here and leave a single bond here. And that should work just as well. So we're actually gonna do both examples so that we can compare them. Okay, so on the left example, let's just go ahead and do what we normally would do and make a double bond on the other side. But on the right side, we'll get weird and make a triple bond. I just erased an extra pair just to redraw it better. Okay. Both of these are good. Both of them have every octet being satisfied. Every atom here has eight electrons. I've used 16 electrons, so these drawings should both be good. But we've learned this one is better. And today we're going to talk about why. And it actually has to do with these individual atoms and how satisfied they all are. So what we can do is assign formal charges. They're kind of mini charges that would go on each of these atoms just to kind of evaluate how they're doing. So we're going to have notes all about this, but just to kind of show you with a full example here, what you're going to do is take for each element, you're going to take its normal number of valence electrons. So carbon, we said normally has four valence electrons or contributes four valence electrons. So you're going to start with that. You're going to start with the number of valence electrons. You're going to subtract the um, number of bonding pairs. Okay. So the number of bonding pairs. The easiest way to think about this 
Um, this isn't probably the best language. Um, the number of bonding pairs, what I really mean by that is how many total bonds is it using or is are touching it? So this carbon actually has four different bonds, which is two double bonds. So what I really mean by number of bonding pairs here um, is how many total lines are touching the C. It'd be helpful to spell. Touching carbon. And I have four lines touching it, so I'm going to subtract four. Then you're finally going to subtract the number of lone electrons. Not lone pairs, just how many total dots do you have? And carbon has zero. There's no more dots around it. So you're going to take its normal number of valence electrons, what it would say on the periodic table, subtract the number of lines touching it, and then subtract the number of dots touching it. And your answer is your formal charge, Fc. The formal charge of carbon here is zero. And I'm going to repeat for oxygen. Oxygen normally has six valence electrons. So this oxygen would normally be six, six minus it one. This one has two bonds touching it. So I'm going to subtract two. And it has four dots. So I'm going to subtract four. And that all equals zero. Zero for that oxygen. This oxygen is exactly identical. It has two lines and four dots. So its formal charge is also zero. As we're going to learn, zeros are great. Zero means it has no sort of charge to it, which means it's kind of the most stable possible arrangement compared to this CO2, though. The carbon, just like this carbon, has four things touching it, four lines. So it has four here and one, or sorry, three here and one here to make four. So even though this one's on another side, carbon's formal charge is still zero. So that's identical. But we have to look at the oxygens. Those are the ones that look a little funny. Let's start with the left oxygen this time. Oxygen normally has six valence electrons, so I'll start with six. Subtract one because I have one line, but then I need to subtract six because I have six dots. Six minus one minus six is negative one. This oxygen has a formal charge of minus one. The oxygen on the right also normally would have six electrons. It has three bonds touching it, so I subtract three. And it only has two dots on it, so I subtract two. Six minus three minus two is one. So that has a one plus formal charge. Okay. So what we're going to learn with formal charges is having as many zeros as possible is preferable. Okay. So this one has these extra charges. This oxygen has a little bit of a negative charge. This one has a little bit of positive charge. It would kind of make sense to just split that up evenly so they both have no charge. And the formal charges tell you that that is the stable configuration. Formal charges are necessary when there are multiple correct Lewis structures for a compound. Okay. So you don't have to do this for everything, but anytime you can draw multiple different options. So I'll show you a couple of ways that that's possible. You could draw, use formal charges to figure out which one's the right one. Formal charges allow us to assess the stability of each individual atom in a compound to help determine the most favorable Lewis structure. Favorable here means the lowest in energy, so you have no unnecessary charges. It's the most stable, meaning it's the least likely to break apart, right? And it's overall the best, most likely structure. The preferred Lewis structure, meaning the right one, like the left CO2 we just did, will have first the smallest possible charges on each atom. This means the lowest number possible on every atom. Zero is the lowest, and then one, either negative one or positive one, would be the next best. And then if you have a negative or positive two or a negative or positive three, that's awful. That is terrible for stability, so you definitely don't want that. Okay? They want to have the smallest possible charges on every atom. Our second rule after that is if you must have a negative charge, which will be the case sometimes, sometimes you'll always have to have a negative somewhere, they should prefer to go on the more electronegative atoms. The more electronegative something is, the more willing it is to take those electrons. So if you have like a fluorine bonded to a carbon, the fluorine should have the negative charge if necessary, or if possible. Okay. So if there's a negative charge, put it on the more electronegative thing. 
here we have five different versions of the phosphate ion. Now, some of these are pretty bad Lewis structures, and some of them are pretty decent, but it's up to us to figure out which one is the best. So if we checked, all of these should um, satisfy the octet rule and use the right number of electrons. Now, I think there's a couple here that might not satisfy the octet rule completely. And those are going to be our worst Lewis structures, and but they're going to be the ones that stick out as really bad to me. So what I'm looking for first is how big the numbers are. Big numbers are really bad. I see a negative three on this phosphorus, which kind of makes sense because this got like 16 electrons around it. That's definitely not what it should have. And that's why it has such a big negative charge. So I can rule this one out like right away. That's a terrible Lewis structure. Okay. I also see this one has a negative two, which means it's probably a little better than this one, but it's still bad. So this Lewis structure also not good. So these two I eliminate because they don't have, they have large numbers on them. You don't want large numbers on your Lewis structure. Which leaves us with three of them where their only numbers are ones or zeros. I notice that um, this one, the top left one, has five numbers though. It has three negatives, two positive, or sorry, four negative ones and one positive one. So it's five total things. These two on the sides have some zeros. And they still only have three ones. So this one is a little bit worse because it has more numbers. More of them are higher. Zero is the lowest and the best. And the bottom left and the bottom right have the most zeros. So now I have to evaluate which of those two is the best. So the one on the left has a negative charge on an oxygen, an oxygen, and an oxygen. The one on the right has a negative charge on an oxygen, an oxygen, and a phosphorus. Okay. So what we need to do is figure out between phosphorus and oxygen, which one's more electronegative. And oxygen is more electronegative. It's the second highest of all the elements right behind fluorine. So that means that this Lewis structure over here is not quite optimal. This negative charge would prefer to be on one of the oxygens, like it is over here on the left. So this left one is the best Lewis structure. It has the lowest numbers, the most possible zeros, and any negative charge it must have is on a more electronegative atom. Okay, so we have again here in your notes, to calculate formal charge, you start with the element's usual amount of valence electrons, like carbon would be four, oxygen would be six, fluorine would be seven, etc. Subtract one for each lone pair electron. So each dot to subtract one, and then subtract one for each total bond touching it. That means a single bond, you subtract one, a double bond, subtract two, a triple bond, subtract three. Also, when you add together at the end all the formal charges of all your different atoms, kind of to check your work, their sum should equal the charge of your ion. Or if it's a neutral atom, the sum should equal zero. So if we go back to this example, our charge is minus three. So if I add up all the formal charges on all examples here, they all add up to negative three. This one's negative three plus four zeros, negative two plus negative one, negative one plus negative one plus negative one. That's a way to kind of check your work. The formal charges should add up to equal your total charge or be zero if there's no total charge. So we want to calculate the formal charges of the center atom in the following examples. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so our atoms we have here, we have, we're starting with, okay, this, this Lewis structure. C is my middle atom, so that's the one I'm going to look at. Carbon normally wants four valence electrons. It has four bonds touching it, subtract four, and no lone pairs. Its formal charge is zero. Nitrogen is my center atom in this next example. So nitrogen normally wants five valence electrons. It has four bonds touching it, zero lone pairs. So its charge is one plus. You overall have a positive one charge, if you add together all of these formal charges, it equals one, so we're good. 
The last example is one of these phosphates. So one that looks like this. I'm not going to draw all those dots. What a waste of time. Phosphorus here normally wants five valence electrons. It's right below nitrogen. Subtract seven. Subtract zero. Negative two. So this must have been the one on the other page with the negative two phosphate. Okay. This kind of ties into our next topic, which is resonance structures. So resonance structures occur when you have multiple valid Lewis structures. We're going to do some more drawings, and we're going to take a look at the Lewis structure of nitrate, NO3 minus. Okay. So we're going to draw it. Draw NO3 minus. All right, nitrogen goes in the middle. I'm going to draw my three oxygens symmetrically around. All right. I have to add lone pairs until everything's happy. Um, let's see how many electrons I have to use here. I have 5 plus, um, that's 18, plus 1. All that together, 24. In my drawing here, I've currently used 8 and 8 and 8, which is 24 plus 2, 26 electrons. So I need to save some electrons with my drawing here. So I'm going to make a double bond. So I'm going to get rid of this lone pair. And then here I'm faced with a choice. Where do I want to make the double bond? Up here or up here or up here? It doesn't matter. I could choose any of them. I'm going to choose the bottom one just because I felt like it. And I'm going to draw a double bond there. Okay. Now that saved me two electrons. And now that's a good Lewis structure. Since it has a charge, I'm just going to remember to write it brackets with a negative charge. Okay. So no, it doesn't matter where you put that double bond. I could have put it here or here or here. Okay. But as we're going to talk about, if is this what really it looks like in real life? Do you really have one bond that's a double bond? Because let's think about what that would mean. That would mean that this bond here, we would learn, as we learned last time, that this is shorter than the other two because it's a double bond. And it has more energy, or it's, I should say more specifically, it's harder to break. So if I was to analyze a nitrate ion, I should see this. I should see one double bond that is um, really hard to break. And then these two other bonds should break somewhat easily. And I don't think it would really matter which one of these you picked, because you could just like rotate the picture. And then you would have been like you picked that one. I think that's what logically makes sense. Let's talk about it. There are three structures for the nitrate ion, depending on which bond you make the double bond. Okay. So just like here, um, this one drew it a little bit like the, uh, facing the other direction with your um, first oxygen directly above. That's totally fine as well. And you see they had three places to pick a double bond and each one picked a different one. All three of these are equally valid equally valid because they have these same formal charges, right? If I did the formal charges of everything here, then this oxygen, I have one that has a double bond and two that have single bonds, but I'd have the same thing here. They'd just be in a different spot. So I have no way to pick which of these is the best. All three of these are equally good. The nitrate ion has one double bond and two single bonds. NO2, the N double bond O bond should be shorter and stronger than the two N O single bonds. But when we study the nitrate ion in real life, that's not what we see. In real life, all three bonds are the same length and the same strength, which doesn't really make sense. So when we actually analyze, if we're analyzing a single nitrate, we know all three bonds are the exact same length and strength which isn't what our picture here is showing. Our picture is showing one bond should be much stronger. Well, it turns out that instead of just making one double bond, molecules instead spread out their electrons equally over each of the possible choices, 
we had three different spots we could have put a double bond, and because they were all equal, instead of choosing just one, your electrons are actually spread out evenly among all three choices. And this is called a resonance hybrid. And I have a picture of what the nitrate ion looks like when you draw its hybrid down here. Each bond has a NO bond that's solid. This solid line is our normal single bond. And then you have a little dashed line. That dashed line, it represents that partial bond. Okay, So each of these bonds isn't a single bond or a double bond. It's one and a part of another bond. This hybrid doesn't have any single or doubles. Instead, it has three, what we could think about like 1.33 bonds, one and a third bonds, which have properties between double and single bonds. Okay? They are stronger than single bonds because they are like a 1.33 bond. They have more electron density holding them together than a single bond. But they're a good bit weaker than double bonds because they don't have as much electron density as a double bond. And this is what we see in real life. You would see the nitrate ion would have energies with its bonds between a single and double bond. And all three would be exactly the same. So we're going to do this with another one to kind of run through the example. I have another ion here that makes a resonance structure. Okay, So we're going to determine the resonance structures and draw the resonance hybrid. Let's do that. So my ion I'm looking at is the CHO2 minus ion. So to draw this, um, it's a little tricky when you have three atoms, but I see a carbon and carbon loves to be in the middle. So I'm going to put that in the middle. And these other three things, I'm just going to spread around. It doesn't matter where I put them. Um, for symmetry reasons, I guess I'll throw the H at the top and the two O's at the bottom, but it truly doesn't matter as long as you spread them out. I could have put the O here and the H here, it's all the same. Okay, and then I need to satisfy the octet rule for everything. So carbon needs two more, and these oxygens each need six more, but the hydrogen's good with just its two. And then to check my work, I'm gonna add up my valence electrons here. Carbon has four, hydrogen has one, oxygen has two times six, and then I have a negative charge, so I need to make sure to add one to account for that. If you add all that up, you get 18 electrons. So I'm going to check my drawing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. My drawing uses too, too many electrons. So just like before, i got to fix that. i got to get it down to 18 by making a double bond. And we're faced with a similar dilemma. I can make a double bond here, or I can make a double bond here. So we're going to have to draw both. We're going to do both options. And those are called drawing all the resonance structures. So on this first one, I'm going to draw the left double bond. And I'm just going to recopy everything else the same, except I'm going to choose the other one next time. Put the double bond over here. Both of them put in brackets and put your charge up here. And those are my two resonance structures. Um, normally I'll draw them like side by side, kind of like that picture of nitrate we had with all the arrows pointing between them. So normally I would draw them like, which I should have done because this is how you always see me do it in class. You draw your first one, and then just draw some arrows, and then draw your second one next to it. Okay. This is how you draw the resonance structures. All the different possible structures that are completely equal. But the question also asked me to draw that resonance hybrid. So I'm going to draw that below. What that means is that's the average of these two. So I'm going to draw a line to each. And then they're going to just split that extra bond. So I'm going to draw a dashed line. But O, the end. We don't worry about drawing these lone pair electrons on the O this time. 
because it's hard to tell exactly how many electrons the O has. So you can leave it just like this. You don't have to draw those extra lone pairs. That's your resonance hybrid. It's a combination of both or all of your resonance structures. The second part of the question is asking about the CO bond. It's asking for a fancy thing called its bond order. And bond order is really simple. If you have a single bond, it's bond order one. If you have a double bond, it's bond order two. And if you have a triple bond, you call it bond order three. It's really simple. But here, I don't have a double or a single bond. I'm in between them. So what I have to do for this one, it makes it a little bit harder. So I had an extra, I had one bond is the straight line. And then because I shared that other bond between two atoms equally, this dotted line here counts for another 0.5. It's half of a double bond because it's one double bond shared between two things. Okay. In my nitrate example, it would actually be a third of a double bond because it would share between three things. That means the bond order for this, you have one for the straight line and 0.5 for the bond. So I'd say its bond order is 1.5. Bond order is a way to evaluate how strong a bond is. And you would usually use it for questions like this, where you have a partial bond. Because if you use it just for this, it's really simple. A single bond has a bond order of one. Okay, so to summarize that information, the bond order is how we measure the type of bonding present. Like we just said, first order means there's a single bond, second order is double, third order is triple. It's pretty simple, but if you have a resonance hybrid, you can have a fraction of a bond order, like our two examples. You would have a 1.33 bond, bond order for the NO bonds in nitrate, and a 1.5 for the CO bonds and CHO2 minus. So this chapter has a bunch of little stuff like this, like bond order. We'll talk about S character and other little things like this that are annoying to remember, but really simple if you know how to do them. So we have five examples here. We're gonna determine the bond order of each one. Okay, I'm not gonna worry about drawing all these just to help save a little bit of time. We're just gonna look at each one. So the simple ones are the ones that are not resonance hybrids, the ones without dashed lines are really easy. This bond is a bond order of two. This one's a bond order of three. CH is a bond order of one. The other two, we have to think about how many groups are sharing that extra bond. So on the right example, this looks just like the one we just did, where you have a double bond being split between two different pairs. So this would be a 1.5 bond order. Each one has the equivalent strength of 1.5 bonds. And our left here, this is a carbonate ion. Looks like we made a double bond and it'd be split up between three equal groups. So you'd say it's a 1.33 bond order, each one. Okay, so that's all about equal resonance structures, but you also have things called unequal resonance structures. So for example, here we have SCN minus. We can determine which of these three drawings is the strongest by looking at their formal charges. And we're going to break it down to compare. So I have three different potential versions here. We're going to learn all three of these are valid. Some are better than others. Okay, so we're going to take each of these and just break out their formal charges, which is good to practice this anyways. These are questions if you see, if you remember to do a formal charge and you see it on the AP exam, You'd be really excited about that because you just really have to do that method. And that's all you need to do for like that point on a problem. It's one of the easier sort of points you could earn if you know how to do it. But a lot of people get it wrong because they just can't remember which thing's a formal charge, which thing's a bond order, et cetera, et cetera. So I have my example here, SCN. I'm just going to break down each one and write their formal charges. So S in this case, it's supposed to be six. If you look at its spot on the periodic table, it's supposed to have six valence electrons, minus it has one bond, minus it has six um, lone pair, or so lone electrons. So that's a negative one formal charge on the sulfur. Carbon, we've had this example a couple of times. It has four bonds, so it's zero. And then nitrogen here is supposed to have five. It has three bonds, so subtract three. It has two dots, subtract two. Right, that is a zero. So those are my formal charges there. I only have one number that's not a zero. That's good. 
what I can kind of think about as we're moving forward here, if I have a negative number, it has to have a negative somewhere, should it be on the sulfur? Should it be on the carbon? Or should it be on the nitrogen? And for that, I have to look at electronegativity. I need to remember, if I have a negative, I should prefer to have that on the most electronegative atom, which as a hint is not sulfur. So that's a hint to me that this one's not very good. Second, we have this version. So let me jot this one down so we can compare. S double bonded to a C, double bonded to an N. If I count everything up, I still have used the same amount of electrons. Everything's good about this Lewis structure. But when I compare the formal charges, okay, sulfur was supposed to have six. This time you subtract two bonds and you subtract four electrons to get zero. So sulfur is down to a zero. Carbon has four bonds, four minus four is zero. Nitrogen this time is supposed to have five. Subtract two for the bonds, subtract four for the dots equals minus one. So this is a better Lewis structure than this one because nitrogen's more electronegative than sulfur, it would be the one that prefer to have this negative charge. And our third drawing, our third version, we're gonna see if somehow we can make it better or if somehow we can make it worse. And based on what I'm looking at, this one looks like it's gonna be worse. Um, my hint is like this nitrogen with all these dots, that looks unnatural to me. So let's break this one down. Sulfur here, supposed to have six, subtract three, subtract two. That's a plus one. Carbon has four bonds, it's still zero. But nitrogen has five, minus one for the bond, minus six for the lone pairs, and it has negative two. So right off the bat, I'm like, that one's gross. Negative two, you don't want high numbers. You want lowest numbers possible. So then like we said, we're comparing these two and we said this one is slightly favorable because the negative is on the more electronegative element. This one's pretty good, and then this one's pretty bad. So, structure B, our second one we drew, is the best Lewis structure because it has the lowest formal charges and the necessary negative charges on the more electronegative element. What we're going to say, and this is pretty complicated, um, these three things still all exist and they still actually make a resonance hybrid. All three of these, if we were to actually test the SCN ion in real life, it would have its electrons spread out according to each of these three shapes. But the most stable one is gonna be the most prevalent in the resonance hybrid. And the way we say that is structure B contributes more to the resonance hybrid. So this isn't gonna be a completely equal sharing of everything like in the previous resonance structures, so we couldn't find the bond order specifically for this one because we don't know exactly like is 90% of it like structure B? Is it like a 99, 90%, 9%, 1% thing? Or is it like a more of a 50-50 thing? We don't really know without studying it further. All we know is that all three of these contribute to the resonance, but since B is the most stable, it contributes the most. The resonance hybrid would look the most like structure B, and but the others would influence the hybrid a little bit. So that's really complicated and really advanced. We don't really need all of that context, but here's kind of what I want you to know. Number one, you can pick the best resonance structure by looking at formal charges, like we've done. If all the formal charges are the same, then all three structures contribute equally to the hybrid. So in the previous examples, all the other ones we've done up to now, we would say that each version, each resonance structure, each different drawing is equal it contributes the same amount to the resonance hybrid. But if one of the structure is more favorable, meaning it has more favorable formal charges, it's more stable, it contributes more to the other structures than the hybrid, or sorry, contributes more to the hybrid than the other structures. And you don't need to know how much more, you don't need to do any math with it, you just need to know, you would basically tell the AP test, this one is the best and it contributes the most to the resonance hybrid, right? Okay. That's like four topics down. We have a few more different weird topics to go. And this is probably the weirdest. Hybridization. So um, hybridization is definitely, there's two sides to it. There is the very complex chemistry side that deals with electron configurations, advanced bonding, um, and a bunch of other topics. And then there is the actual thing we need to know how to do. The actual thing we need to know how to do is super easy. 
the easiest point you can earn on the test. Probably, uh, ish. All right, one of the easiest points you can earn on the test. Um, the, compl the explanation is very, very difficult. And it's easy to get lost in the sauce. If you're feeling a little lost in the sauce, focus on the application. We kind of need to know the, the explanation behind it, but it's really not the biggest deal. So we're going to have like five slides in a row. You have like a full page of your guided notes that explain how hybridization works. So listen to that. Maybe it'll be enlightening for you. If not, um, just know how to do it when we get to the end examples. So our example we'll be running through is a CH4, a methane molecule. It's made of four completely equal CH bonds. Okay. So if we were to draw the Lewis structure, you'd have a C single bonded to an H four times, and all four of those bonds should be, by definition, completely identical. Below, I have the orbital diagram of the carbon, the center part of that. The carbon is making four bonds, right, with the different hydrogens. As we know, carbon likes to make four bonds. So a covalent bond is created by sharing electrons. So the carbon will loan out one electron to pair with each hydrogen or whatever other atom you're doing this with. Let's look at this orbital diagram, though. So to make a bond, you need to give one of your electrons and pair it with one of your friend's electrons, right? One of the other elements' electrons. But if I look at its electron configuration as it is currently, only two of my electrons are unpaired, meaning only these two electrons I could actually currently donate out. This electron is already paired up with this electron. So there's no way for this to make four bonds as it is. I can only make two because I only have two available unpaired valence electrons. Well, so we came up with a solution. It was relatively simple. Um, basically, you just take one of those paired electrons that was here and you just upgrade it to the 2p orbital. One of the 2s electrons would just move up to this empty 2p and now you have four empty arrows already. They're all alone by themselves. They're all ready to make a bond. Okay, so I have a 2s electron and three 2p electrons all ready to go make a bond and that looked better, but it led to another problem. So the bonds made using the 2p electrons. So these three bonds here, okay, these electrons currently have a little bit higher energy. They're drawn a little bit higher on my orbital diagram and we know the 2p orbital is a little bit further away from the nucleus and a little bit higher energy than the 2s orbital. What that means is one of your electrons is different than your other three. The bonds made using those 2p electrons would be identical, but the bond made using that lower energy 2s electron would be a little bit lower in energy. The 2s orbital is lower in energy than the 2p orbital, which would just basically mean that one of your bonds should be slightly different. And if we were to analyze that, we should be able to find, okay, this is your, this is your 2s bond here. This one's a little bit weaker than your other three, and that's okay. But that's not what we see. Again, similar to resonance structures, when we study things like methane, we see all four of them have exactly the same energy. So we have to explain how can all four of them have the same energy? What happens physically to the electrons to make that happen? So this is kind of it. Scientists came up with a new explanation that the 2s orbital and the 3 2p orbitals blend together or hybridize to create four exactly equal orbitals. These orbitals are in between the energy of the 2s and the 2p orbital. They have slightly more energy than a 2s orbital and slightly less energy than a 2p orbital. It's kind of like an average or a hybridized version. They split the difference so that each electron has the same amount of energy to bond with. And that would make all four of the bonds equal if this were true. So what they end up doing is the 2s and 2p orbitals merge to make what we call sp3 orbitals, which the name sounds complicated, right? You're throwing letters and numbers, but that's all it is. You have one s orbital, so you write one s. You have three p orbitals, so you write p to the third. So this is an orbital made from one s and three p's. And we would say that the carbon in CH4 is sp3 hybridized. If I check my electron configuration, so this, these new lines are a little bit higher than where that old 2s orbital was, but just a touch lower than where that 2p orbital was. And they're just called sp3 orbitals that are right in between the energy of both of those. Which is confusing. There are a few other types of hybridizations as well. 
Um, if something makes two bonds, it only needs two electrons available, it'll be sp hybridized, which is just one s and one p blended together. And if something needs to make three bonds, it's sp2 hybridized, means one s and two p orbital. But let's talk how to just practically solve a problem about hybridization. So if you zoomed out during that, this is where you need to come back, okay? So if something bonds to two atoms or lone pairs, we call it sp hybridized, okay? If something is bonded to three atoms or lone pairs, it is sp2 hybridized. And if something is bonded to four atoms or lone pairs, it's sp3 hybridized. And that's all you need to know. You count the number of things it's bonded to, each atom it's bonded to counts as one, and each lone pair it has counts as one. And you just think, use this kind of idea to figure out which one's which. Two bonds, sp, three bonds, sp2, four bonds, sp3. And that's all you need to do. So when you look at a Lewis structure, it should be pretty easy to identify the hybridization without having to worry about those five slides of um, theoretical chemistry stuff we were talking about. So we have five examples here, and they're all relatively easy. What's the hybridization of the central atom in the following molecules? Just go to that middle atom. So like here I have a carbon. It's bonded to two things. SP hybridized. That's all you have to do. You don't count the number of bonds for this one, which is opposite of formal charges. So that can be confusing. For hybridization, you're counting the physical amount of things it's bonded to. So it's bonded to one oxygen, bonded to two oxygens. SP hybridized. Going over here to the right, this carbon is bonded to four things. So it is sp3 hybridized. Bottom left, this oxygen is our center atom, and we have to be careful because these lone pairs count two. So this is bonded to two hydrogens, and it has two lone pairs, which makes four total things. So this oxygen is sp3 hybridized. Boron in the middle here is bonded to three things, sp2 hybridized. And at the right, we have a carbon bonded to three things and one lone pair, which is four total things, sp3 hybridized. And that's all you have to do for hybridization. I'm not going to make you explain, go through all that explanation, but you should kind of know, I guess, what it means. But really, you just need to be able to look at an atom and tell me it's hybridization. Along with this, we have something called bond character. The s character and the p character of a hybridized orbital. It's basically saying what percentage of your new blended orbital comes from the S sublevel and what percentage it comes from the P sublevel. And you basically just kind of follow this information and it makes sense. The SP orbital is made of one S and one P, which means it's 50% S and 50% P. So if something is SP hybridized, you would say it has 50% S character. SP2 is made of one S and two P's, Therefore, 33% of it is S, and 67% of it is P. An sp3 hybridized atom is 25% S, because there's only one S, and 75% P, because there's three Ps. All those add up to 100, and that's the character of a bond. Another of these super minor little details that, if you know how to do it, is really easy, and if you don't, you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about right now. We have another one of those, called pi and sigma bonding. So... We still have several more to go this chapter. This is just grab bag of different bonding topics. So we have two different types of bonding. We have sigma bonding and pi bonding. And they physically look different, right? And they're, how they look is kind of complicated. To draw them in three dimensions is hard. But again, if you know how to do this, it's really easy. A sigma bond is the scientific name for a regular single bond. So if you have a single bond, that is a sigma bond. So simple enough. Go back to these examples. For example, this boron has three, oops, three sigma bonds, because that's three single bonds. This one's got two sigma bonds, four sigma bonds, three sigma bonds. This one's double bond, so it's a little bit different. Okay. Um, here we go. Pi bondings are a little bit more complicated, and they can be more confusing because each additional bond is a pi bond. The first bond you make is always a single. And if you have a double bond, that means you have your original single you still have, and then your new bond is a double bond. And that is the pi bond. So a double actually is made of one of each. One sigma, one um, pi. A triple bond, you're adding one extra pi bond. 
So it has one sigma still, that original bond is still sigma. The next two, the extra bonding, are pi bonds. That means every single bond, single or double or triple, has one sigma bond. The pi bonds is the only thing that changes. A single bond has no pi bonding, a double has one, a triple has two. And to draw them in three dimensions, it looks something like this. So I've added this. It's pretty minor, but you could see something about it. So I just wanted you to be slightly familiar with it. A pi bond. So here I have carbon bonded to carbon. The first bond is a sigma bond. So one of these two doubles is a sigma. And they show that over here on the right. That first bond is a regular straight sigma bond. And we always just represent that with a straight line. Because we have a double bond, we also have one pi bond. But when you draw one pi bond, it looks like this. It actually has two different lobes around that sigma bond. And electron density is shared between both of these lobes. Which is weird, because you're only adding one extra bond, but you're adding two lobes for electrons. And if you go to a triple bond, like ethene here, you have a carbon-carbon triple bond. That's our one sigma bond in the middle that's flat. And then each pi bond adds two opposite lobes. So there's four total areas of extra bonding in a um, triple bond. This is just a little bit important because you kind of know the difference between a sigma and a pi bond. Pi bond is just this kind of extra bonding, these extra lobes around where electrons can be. And we get to the last but definitely most important topic um, for the AP exam for my class is Vesper bonding. And hopefully you've heard about Vesper theory at least a little bit in um, chemistry classes before, but um, it's a little bit more complicated version of Lewis structures. It's an improved model of molecules used to predict their orientation in three dimensions. It is used hand in hand with Lewis structures to help us further understand what molecules actually look like. Vesper stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion, but that doesn't matter. A Vesper model, when you think, when you see that word Vesper, that is just your 3D shape, what your monocle looks like in three dimensions. All right, so we're getting near the end. We have eight slides left, but this topic's pretty important. I'd also say this topic's very memorization heavy, which is really unfortunate, but it is. So the Vesper, which I spelled wrong in the word here, it starts with V-S-E-P-R. The Vesper shape will predict the 3D shape of a molecule based on two things. We need the number of bonding pairs. The number of bonding pairs is just how many total things the center atom is bonded to. It doesn't care about double or triple, it's just how many things is it bonded to. And the number of lone pairs, which is just how many total lone pairs are on that center atom. The only atom we need to look at for a Vesper shape is that center atom. All right, and here is my chart. All you have to look at is how many electron pairs you have, how many of them are bonding, and how many of them are lone pairs, and then you just figure out the name of the shape from that. So if you're looking at an atom and it has um, four total pairs and three of them are bonding pairs and one of them is a lone pair, the name of that shape is trigonal pyramidal. I would say 100%, if I were you, I would highlight and definitely know um, let's see the best way to do it. Um, I guess we can do this in class, but whatever. We'll talk about it real quick. I would definitely know linear. 3, 0 is trigonal planar. I would definitely know that. 4, 0 is tetrahedral. 5 and 0 is trigonal bipyramidal. And 6 and 0 is octahedral. Those are kind of our default shapes. If there's no lone pairs, those are the our shapes that are important. Linear for 2 and 0. Um, trigonal planar for 3 and 0, tetrahedral for 4 and 0, 5 and 0 is trigonal bipyramidal, 6 and 0 octahedral. Those are the most important ones. Adding lone pairs is just going to slightly modify that shape. The most important ones are 3 and 1 makes trigonal pyramidal, and 2 and 2 makes bent. Those are the ones you're going to be using constantly, and those are kind of the most important ones. So I would know all the ones with electron pair 4, that's kind of our most common molecule, and then I would know um, all the other regular default ones, those zero lone pair versions. I'm never going to ask you on this test, like, what is a T-shaped one or a square pyramid? Because those are really obscure and very, very rare. But if you get a question about it, you can use this table to help you out. So 
We have an example here. It says, draw the Lewis structure, then predict the Vesper shape of each of the following. So starting off with some CH4. Nice, classic, easy to draw CH4. It's important to draw the shape because we need to know how many lone pairs and how many bonding pairs you have. But with CH4, it's actually relatively simple. You have four bonding pairs and zero lone pairs. So you reference your chart and you find the name of the shape. Tetrahedral. For me, this doesn't look like a tetrahedral, like a fancy looking shape like that. And that's because this one's actually only drawn in two dimensions. You can draw um, any of the Lewis structures with more than three things will actually be three dimensional. If there's only two bonding pairs or three bonding pairs, it's actually planar, meaning it's not three dimensional. But if there's four, five or six bonds, they go into three dimensions. The idea is these H's want to get as far away from each other as possible. They repel each other. So this is as far away as they can get from each other in a 2D plane. And that's 90 degrees away from each other. But it turns out in th four and sorry, in three dimensions, they can get a little bit further away. So we can kind of draw what it looks like. Um, I'm not the best at drawing in three dimensions, but um, basically, you can imagine you have a carbon and a hydrogen and a carbon and a hydrogen, and these are flat. So these are in line with the paper. So this is just like a normal 2D section. But then your other two hydrogens aren't going to be flat up going up like this. One's actually going to be sticking out of the page, kind of at an angle up like this. And the second one's actually going to go on back into the paper down like this. And we draw it, the one coming out at you, you draw with a wedge to represent that it's like not up here. It's supposed to be coming out at the page. And the one in the back, you draw with a little dashed line to represent that one's going back into the page. And that's actually what that looks like in three dimensions. And you can look up a drawing if you want to see it better, but that's like my version of it. And it turns out these hydrogens are all exactly 109.5 degrees away from each other. So spreading out into three dimensions, let them get further apart, which they like. Okay, back to the question at hand, though. We have CO2. Not going to go through the whole process of drawing CO2 because we've done it multiple times. Carbon only has two things here. So I have two bonds, zero lone pairs, and because of that, it is linear. That one's kind of easy to remember because it's a line. Right? A lot of them are called linear as well. There's actually like four different ones called linear. So it's a pretty good guess if your thing's in a straight line. Call it linear. And last, we have NH3. So if you go through the process of drawing NH3, we would normally draw it like that, but you end up having to put a lone pair on this nitrogen. That lone pair changes the shape, and it's really important to talk about. We're going to do a couple examples, but the idea is this lone pair, it has two electrons, and those electrons are squished into a really tiny space. The two electrons in a bond are spread out. These two electrons can go anywhere between the N and the H in this larger area. So what that means is these take up more space. So they're actually going to kind of push these other H's out of the way. And we treat this just like another bond. So you can actually draw this one in three dimensions as well. You could draw like, um, Usually this one to be drawn kind of like lone pair on the top. That's just flat in the board. And then you have um, three different ones coming off of here. You have one that goes straight back, one that comes straight forward, and one that goes off to the side. And it kind of makes like a tripod. Let me try to draw a little better. So you can imagine a tripod here nitrogen with a leg coming out in front, one going into the back, one going to the side, and it makes like a tripod camera. And each of those legs of that tripod are held down by a hydrogen. And then you have two on the top. And we'd like to draw this on this way because this lone pair takes up a little bit more space and is going to push and squish these hydrogens a little bit closer together than they normally would be. So this shape is four groups total. It's made of three bonds 
and one lone pair. We called four things up here tetrahedral, but this one is actually called trigonal pyramidal. The extra lone pair changes the shape a little bit because it has a more condensed electron density and it kind of squishes and redirects the shape just a little bit. The bond angle here was actually 109.5 degrees. These got squished a little bit closer and it ends up being something around 107 degrees. So the extra strength of the lone pair squished these legs closer together. Maybe if I draw this like down a little bit, maybe it helps. I don't know. It's hard to draw. You're not going to be responsible for drawing a 3D. I'm just trying to do my best to show it to you. So to figure out the Vesper shape, all you need to do is figure out how many bonds and lone pairs you have, and then go to that chart, tell me the shape. As we just said, lone pairs have more electron density than a bonding pair. You have the same two electrons, but they aren't spread out as much. Okay? The negative charge is a lot more concentrated. This means the lone pairs end up taking up more space, right? They kind of push away the other things, trying to get further away from it. They'll bully bonding pairs to push them away to make more space for themselves, and H2O is a great example. Lots of questions earlier about why H2O looks the way it does, and now we can answer it. H2O. So, H2O, it would make sense to draw it something like this. But we've always said H2O, now you need to draw it like this. Okay, This one should have two lone pairs, and you could draw them here. But we end up always drawing this bottom one. And this bottom one is the correct one. If I wanted to check its Vesper shape, it has two bonds and two lone. And that's a type of tetrahedral, but it's a special one called bent. And that definitely looks bent. Well, the idea is the same thing we are kind of doing before. These electrons here want to take up as much space as they can. So because of that, they like to be on the same side so that they can push and squish these hydrogens really close to each other. And by really close, I mean it only goes down to about 104 degrees. But this arrangement lets these lone pairs take up a lot more space. Because of that, these hydrogens get pushed together more, allowing these to spread out. There's fancier drawings that draw this a lot better that you could look up and see if you wanted. But each of these dots basically are taking up all this sort of space, all this electron density. So there's two electrons kind of in this area. And because that electron area is so strong, it pushes these like more straight electron areas down towards each other. So anytime you have something with two bonds and two lone pairs, it's going to have this bent orientation. And the word, the naming of bent, the Vesper shape, can help you realize, oh, okay, I need to draw this thing crooked. Okay, so kind of back to this chart for a second. There's two of them that are called bent, and we'll have this shape. So that is if you have two bonds with one lone pair, that'll also have the same sort of bent shape. The lone pair will go up at the top, and the two bent ones will go towards the bottom. And the one at the top is going to cause those things to kind of bend down because it's going to take up more of that space. And then the one we just saw, the water. Those are the only two I want you to worry about drawing with the correct shape. All the other ones pretty much work out. You don't have to worry about drawing them in 3D, but these two. So water and anything else that fits this criteria here, two and one. But that one's really rare. You won't see that one hardly at all. But the water is very, very common. And you would do that for water or anything else that has two and two. All right. So our last couple slides here, we've been talking about bond angles a little bit. So the bond angle is the angle between two adjacent bonds in a molecule. And here are the most common ones you'll need. Linear, a straight molecule, has an angle of 180, which makes sense. Trigonal planar is 120. These two are great, and they make perfect sense to our brains because they're in two dimensions. Both these objects would be completely flat, because that's the furthest these things can get away from each other, is to be in a flat plane. But as you get to these more complicated, they get into three dimensions, because that's the way that the electron pairs can get the furthest away from each other. So the tetrahedral, like we said, has this sort of shape, which hopefully that helps you see sort of, sort of that tripod shape I was trying to draw. 
and that 109.5 degree bond angle. 100% you need to know that. That is definitely on the AP exam. It's definitely on my exam. The most common one to ask about is to say, why doesn't the tetrahedral have 90 degree bond angle? And the answer, because it's in 3D in three dimensions, four objects can get away from each other with 109.5 degrees. The other two, this next one's really weird, especially trigonal bipyramidal. It looks super strange. You have basically a flat three trigonal planers. So these three I'm pointing to are trigonal planers. So it's like this, but sideways. So that's a 120 degree angle, as we just talked about here. But you have two more pairs going straight up and straight down, and that makes like a right angle. So you actually have a 90 degree bond angle and a 120 degree bond angle, depending on which bond you're talking about. Fortunately, though, once you get to an octahedral, you have four things all in plane with each other, so it makes a right angle, a 90 degree angle, and the ones going up and down also make a 90 degree angle. So to summarize, these are by far the most important bond angles that you need to know. Um, linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, octahedral. These are the ones I would recommend knowing. And if you, even if you don't understand why, like trigonal bipyramidal looks like that, if the 3D doesn't click for your brain, which is totally fair, just kind of know these numbers then. And like I said, tetrahedral, 100% most important one. Okay, and then just to end, lone pairs affect that bond angle. Like we were talking about a little bit before, having a lone pair or multiple will just lower that bond angle. And you are not responsible for knowing exactly how much it lowers it, but you should know in general that it does. So in our water example here, these lone pairs squish these hydrogens a little bit closer together and lower your bond angle by a few degrees. A normal tetrahedral, if these were just lines up here, it would have 109.5 degrees but replacing the bonds with lone pairs makes the angle 104.5. And our last slide, limitations of Lewis structures. Lewis structures are pretty good models of atoms, but there are quite a few limitations. First of all, they oversimplify what a bond looks like. If you Google the actual 3D structure of these things, you're gonna be really confused because they look very, very complicated. In real life, when things bond, there's not a little line connecting them, but that's just how we draw it in our model. They don't show three dimensions. The Vesper helps to kind, of, to kind of help you understand the three dimensions, but the Lewis structure doesn't. And the last kind of most important limitation of Lewis structures and why they're not perfect is that you may have noticed we only ever draw them for an even number of valence electrons. You can only have a pair of lone, a lone pair or a bonding pair. So you can only go up by two, but there's molecules, there's plenty of them that exist that have an odd number by chance. And the Lewis structures aren't good at drawing those. Right? In real life, sometimes you have a single electron, and that's fine. They don't have to be paired. And we actually have a special name for that called a free radical. All right, so that is our last slide for today. Um, hopefully, go over all these topics. Hopefully, some of them stick. I know some of them will take a little bit of work. The Vesper takes a bit of memorization, and the other ones are just kind of recognizing which little thing they're asking for, and that's really important. Okay. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you soon.